Good morning, everyone. My name is Kate Nielsen, and I'm the education lead for BC Nonprofit Housing Association, and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar, Residential Tenancy Law During the COVID-19 Pandemic, facilitated by Ripon Hands, Associate Lawyer with Haddock and Company Lawyers. This webinar is presented by BC Nonprofit Housing in partnership with Haddock and Company. At this point, if you have any technical questions or issues, please visit the GoToWebinar support URL shown on the screen at the bottom there at support.goto.com forward slash webinar. Before we begin, I'll give you a brief outline of the format. The presentation will take approximately 30 minutes, after which time the presenter will address questions that were submitted in advance. This will then be followed by an open question and answer period for which we've allotted approximately 30 minutes. And our goal is to finish up by 11.15. During the session, please feel free to type in your questions at any time by using the chat feature. We'll then do our best to address all the questions during the open Q&A segment. At this point, we'd like to clarify that this session is based on COVID-19 as it relates to the Residential Tenancy Act. Some of the advanced questions previously submitted uh, ventured into areas of employment law, wills and estates, which is not the topic of this webinar. We therefore really appreciate keeping your questions to the topic at hand. And for your information, BCMPHA is planning more webinars, which will include employment law and other topics. So for any questions that aren't a fit here, we'll aim to cover them off in other webinars. This webinar is being recorded and the audience will be muted, which means that you can hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. And again, please type in your questions using the chat feature at any time. A recording of this webinar will be sent out within a few days and you'll be able to access the PowerPoint there, so you don't need to worry if you miss something today. At the end of the session, we'll send out a quick evaluation survey to everyone and we'd really appreciate you taking a minute or so to complete it. Next slide, please. Before we start the presentation, I would like to extend a big thank you to our BCMPHA education partners whose support has enabled online professional development opportunities for the community housing sector. I'd also like to acknowledge Lisa Edwards, who is participating in the webinar. Lisa is a consultant for getthepicture.ca and will be creating a virtual visual recording of the webinar, which will be sent out to all participants as well. We're excited to have Lisa join us and look forward to the visual summary with key points from our discussion. Next slide, please. Great, now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Ripon Hans was called to the British Columbia Bar Association in 2017 and currently works in landlord tenancy law. She has appeared for clients on matters regarding the RTA at the tribunal level the Supreme Court of British Columbia, and at the Court of Appeal. You can find more information about Ripon at haddock-co.ca, and you'll also be able to see contact details for Haddock and Company, which are included at the end of the slide presentation. Now over to you, Ripon. Thank you, Kate. Um, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'd also like to um, give a huge thanks to BC Nonprofit Housing Association for, um, I guess, organizing this webinar um, and on this uh, topic that we all can't seem to stop talking about or get enough of. <laughs> it's very pervasive, of course, and for good reason, COVID-19. So as Kate mentioned, um, specifically, we're going to discuss um, how the pandemic and this declared, declared state of emergency is impacting residential tenancies and what that means for landlords. So I'll start off as well by elaborating a little bit about our firm. Um, Kate kind of touched on this as well. We've been um, recognized as leaders in um, this very niche area of the law, specifically when it comes to navigating residential um, tenancies and the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, we've appeared at all levels of court, including the tribunal, um, the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal when it comes to residential tenancy matters. Um, I was lucky enough to wrap up one before this emergency order came into effect, um, which saved that landlord, so to speak. So now I'll just go into um, 
an overview, which uh, Kate kind of provided um, as well. So the brunt of kind of my lecture is going to be um, discussing uh, the changes to the Residential Tenancy Act that have been enacted through this ministerial order. Um, so that's what we'll go, go into today for um, the first half of the seminar. So I'll discuss what uh, the order has changed um, in terms of law and what that means for landlords. Um, as Kate mentioned, that's going to be followed by a Q&A session. Um, please make sure to submit your questions as they arise to Kate um, through the avenue provided. Um, and then I will get to them at the end. Um, I've also throughout this, um, I guess, PowerPoint, which is going to be available if it isn't already to all attendees, um, there's a lot of resources and more information um, that's included. Uh, so if your questions aren't answered today, um, there's some great links there um, where you can follow up. Um, there's some also some um, wonderful information to keep on hand just so that you're up to date with the changes um, with regards to COVID-19 as they come up. So um, some of the links um, here that I provided specifically are um, the following. So the BC Nonprofit Housing Association's research, resources on COVID-19 is wonderful. So this is where they compile relevant news that's um, you know coming up with regards to COVID as it appears with nonprofit housing providers. Um, also great information on BC Housing um, and their statements and releases. So it's a wonderful um, resource to access um, and keep bookmarked if you haven't already. Um, for those housing providers that receive funding through um, CMHC, um, they also have a COVID news page. So I've included that there as well. Um, this one's really great to bookmark. So the Residential Tenancy Board um, has um, this one web page where they're posting COVID-related um, orders as they come up, um, directives from the um, director of the Residential Tenancy Board. And it also has a great list of frequently answered questions regarding this most recent change in law that's been enacted under the emergency order. So a lot of what we cover today, um, questions related to the same, that fax page is great. So I've included a link to that just so you can keep handy. Um, considering that um, nonprofit housers uh, usually um, provide housing to vulnerable segments of the population, I've also included a link to the Human Rights Tribunal. Um, they have a page for news and updates, um, including updates regarding COVID-19. There hasn't been too much change um, in regards to the Human Rights Tribunal. Uh, for the most part, it's business as usual. Um, I, I'm going to discuss some of that at, uh, near the tail end of this presentation, just as it might be of interest to some of the attendees today. Um, the Ministry of Health is great. So the Ministry of Health and their regional subsidiaries have wonderful resources on um, how to deal with COVID, information for tenants, um, practices regarding social distancing, when tenants can report um, suspected cases if they think they have um, symptoms, um, what landlords can do, even information on cleaning protocols and um, information um, employers can give to employees um, that are related to COVID, what this means um, for workers and how they can protect themselves. So I've included that link too. Um, it's good to have handy. And lastly, if um, some attendees, um, if they're providing, uh, I know some nonprofit housers um, provide housing to Indigenous communities. So the First Nations Health Authority is another great resource that um, also is providing regular updates on their page um, with regards to COVID-19. All right, so let's get into it. Um, so we're going to start off by um, discussing what the law says um, in regards to uh, what changes have been made. So we're gonna start this talk by going over the legal changes. So these are legal changes, it's law. So landlords are required to abide by these changes now that they've been enacted. So as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, a residential tenancy order was made by the Minister of Public Safety and the Solicitor General under the Emergency Program Act. Its official title is the Ministerial Order Number M089. Um, this was enacted into law on March 30th, 2020, so it's been in force until then. We're gonna go over the um, contents of this order in detail, but um, if you want to read it in full, I've included a link to the full text, so knock yourself out. You can peruse it if you'd like. Um, but like I said, we're gonna go over everything the order includes um, in detail uh, today. Um, as I've stated as well, so the order is now law, um, so there's no way to kind of get around it. Um, these are the new rules that landlords have to abide by now. 
if um, landlords have an understanding of the act or if there's something in the act or policy guidelines that you follow that conflicts with the order, the order precedes that. So the order is the final say for now. In terms of how long the order will stay in effect, um, I want to say indefinitely for now. So um, the order is essentially in place until uh, the minister um, declares and passes another order stating that the state of emergency is cancelled or over. So until that happens, um, the state of, the um, emergency order and its contents are in place and landlords have to abide by, abide by them. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So this is just an overview of um, what the emergency order covers. Um, we're going to go over each of these in detail, but this is just like a brief outline of the changes that have been made. So the orders um, change some of the law in regards to uh, ending tenancies, what landlords can do, what they can't do. Um, you know, uh, I guess I should say, um, We'll get into that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm digressing. Um, the next part of the order covers evictions. So what do you do if you do have an order of possession? Um, can you file it in the Supreme Court? What can't you do in that regard? Um, the order also has, um, a, um, I guess, a header that discusses rent payments, um, whether tenants are still liable for rent, what landlords can or can't do if a tenant fails to pay rent on time. Rent increases are also covered. Um, there's also some changes um, regarding um, the landlord's ability and right to restrict access to parts of the residential uh, building. Um, also, there's some changes in regards to a landlord's right to enter a tenant's individual unit that are noteworthy. And lastly, this isn't in the body of the order, but the um, Residential Tenancy Board's um, director has also issued um, a directive, which has made some changes to how to serve documents. Um, some timelines that are um, relevant to the residential tenancy uh, dispute um, procedure. So we'll go over that at the end as well. So, so to start, um, we'll get into the first subtopic or subheading that's covered by this emergency order um, with regards to ending tenancy. <laughs> I'm sure it's not a newsflash to many of you, but essentially there's a moratorium on um, ending tenancies during this period. So landlords cannot issue a new notice to end tenancy um, as long as this emergency order remains in effect. Um, so that includes the fact that landlords cannot pay or it cannot end a tenancy if a tenant um, you know, fails to pay rent. Um, the landlord can't end a tenancy if they want to renovate the unit, if they want to clear it out for landlord's use. Um, interestingly, um, this also prevents landlords from ending a tenancy um, or serving a notice to end tenancy if a tenant fails to qualify for a rental unit in subsidized housing. Okay, there are some exceptions. Um, so a landlord can um, end a tenancy uh, if a tenant if that's needed um, to protect the health and safety or prevent undue damage to property so this is um, labeled as a um, exceptional circumstance so in exceptional circumstances um, what landlords do is um, they don't serve notices to end tenancy um, what you do is um, you go to the rtv online portal and you apply for dispute resolution to end the tenancy um, because it's an emergency and it's necessitated um, so some examples, of course, of exceptional circumstances are normally the following. Um, if the tenant uh, threatens the safety, security of others, or if um, the tenant um, is responsible for any, excuse me, any violence, um, if the tenant poses an immediate threat to property, or if the tenant has damaged property, um, uh, whether or not the tenant not following the rules of social distancing and putting others at risk um, is an emergency that by which the ten the landlord can apply for dispute resolution to end the tenancy during this time is unclear. You can try it. It hasn't been proven or disproven at the Residential Tenancy Board yet, but normally the other ones are pretty clear, pretty standard. So if you have a difficult tenant that's, you know, engaging in any one of these behaviors, you would just apply directly with the RTB and proceed with dispute resolution. All right, so I, I'll kind of backtrack. Um, and um, with regards to notices to end tenancy that were given to a landlord before March 30th. So if a landlord has a notice to end tenancy 
or served a tenant, I should say, with a notice to end tenancy, let's say, for landlord's use for material breach sometime in February, January, any time before March 30th. If you served a notice, a tenant with a notice to end tenancy then, that's still valid. Um, so what happens with those is um, essentially uh, either a dispute hearing will be held. Um, so the RTB dispute process is going forward business as usual. So if you've served an old notice to end tenancy and that still has to be heard and decided on, um, you'll attend the dispute resolution hearing as scheduled and the arbitrator either will or won't issue an order of possession. Um, we've seen a few things. So technically during this emergency order, um, landlords aren't uh, supposed to end tenancies. But if an arbitrator is hearing um, a matter regarding an old notice to end tenancy, we've uh, had situations where even if it's for a non-emergency purpose, arbitrators will postpone the hearing just so it's heard sometime in July or June. And then maybe then it could be proceed with um, business as usual and is issuing an order of possession. We've also had people, um, there was one case where a landlord wanted to end the tenancy um, to occupy the unit themselves. That was served in November. And then um, what happened in that case, which was heard just this past week, was that the arbitrator did grant an order of possession with an effective date of September 2020. So um, the hearing will proceed. You might be ordered with uh, or issued with the order of possession. Of course, um, whether you can enforce that order of possession largely depends. Um, and we'll kind of get into that in the next, uh, next slide. Um, so if you are dealing with an old order of possession that you have on hand and you haven't yet, in that, in, um, I guess, enforced, for the most part, you can't enforce that order of possession. Um, so this kind of takes us into part two, um, evictions. Um, so if a landlord applies for an RTB dispute hearing to end a tenancy during this period while the order is in effect under exceptional circumstances, um, then you can file that with the Supreme Court. Okay, so um, what we're recommending to our clients is um, that uh, they ask the arbitrator to specifically say that, um, you know, an order of possession is being granted um, in the state of emergency under Section 55 or Section 56 of the Act. Um, it's very important that the arbitrator cite that emergency section of the Act in both the decision and the specific order, because if they don't, um, the Supreme Court might reject that order. They might reject to file that order of possession. So this saves the landlord having to go back to the dispute process. So um, just be mindful of that. If you're trying to end a tenancy during this time because of an emergency or an exceptional circumstance, ask the arbitrator to note that in their decision. Um, and if that isn't in the decision once you receive the physical copy, you can easily apply with the RTB online for a quick um, correction or clarification of that decision. And then the arbitrator will likely just, um, you know, uh, enter in that uh, provision of the act that they might have forgotten to include. Um, so what about, um, again, well, with regards to old order possessions, if you have an order of possession um, that's dated before March 30th, um, it won't, it, it won't be filed. The Supreme Court will reject it if you try to file it um, and obtain a writ of possession. Um, again, they're very clear that they're only going to um, give out writs of possessions and file order of possessions for the same if um, it's an emergency or an exceptional circumstance. So if you have a writ of possession, if you've already filed an old order of possession that's dated before March 30th, and that writ of possession is dated before March 30th, um, you can't enforce it. It's a general pause on enforcing writs of possessions, um, except if, unless they're issued now after the order has been in effect and because now the Supreme Court's only issuing them under that emergency provision. I will note um, that court registries are closed. So if you get to the stage where um, you are proceeding with uh, filing an order of possession before the court, um, it's best to just call the court registry by telephone if you need any further assistance. Um, also, the Supreme Court has issued a directive um, 
whereby they're saying that um, the court's only going to be hearing urgent matters. Um, so technically, um, RTB uh, cases where you're ending a tenancy, that's considered an urgent matter, of course, but um, whether or not you'll get a hearing isn't an automatic given. Um, what parties have to do if they're trying to file an order of possession and a hearing before a judge is required, um, this might happen, let's say, if the tenant is um, wanting to stay in order of possession or obtain a judicial review, it's not going to automatically be heard. Um, the way that the court is kind of looking at this is parties have to first upload all the files um, and then electronically, and then a judge will look at it and decide whether that specific case is urgent enough that it requires a hearing before a judge. Um, so it's a long process to actually get into the courts and get a hearing if you need one. Um, if you do get to the stage um, when you're trying to enforce a writ of possession, um, I'd encourage members to consult a lawyer for some legal advice just to make sure you're following the steps. Um, so that's kind of a summary on order of possessions, writs of possessions. Um, for the most part, they are being granted um, only in exceptional circumstances. So that's kind of the rule of thumb to know. Um, so if you have an order of possession lying around, if it's before or granted during this emergency order, you won't be able to enforce it. Uh, the tenant's just going to have to sit tight for the time being. Um, so let's just move on now to the other topic that's covered by this emergency order rent payments. Um, so tenants are still obligated to pay rent. They must still pay rent. Uh, I'm not sure who created this rumor that uh, <laughs> tenants don't have to pay rent. It's very per per um, pervasive. I've heard it. Um, I think I've even seen an Instagram meme on it. That's not the case. That's not what the law says. Um, tenants have to pay rent. Um, of course, because of COVID-19, uh, they might not have the same ability to do so. There's, you know, people suffering um, income loss or employment loss because of this pandemic. So there are some supports in place for tenants. Um, the uh, province is um, offering a rental supplement um, for low to moderate income tenants that are suffering or facing financial hardship because of COVID-19. Um, so that's an amount of $500 a month. Um, and right now, I think it's granted over a period of three months. So $500 for three months going forward. The application for tenants um, to apply for that is through BC Housing. But this uh, provincial rent supplement, um, it might not, uh, uh, I guess, be available to most of the tenants um, uh, rent, you know, that are renting under uh, under nonprofit housing providers. So, if um, a tenant already receives income or disability assistance, they can't get this provincial rent subsidy. Um, if a tenant lives in government subsidized housing, they also don't qualify for this provincial rent subsidy. Um, yeah, so th those are some barriers and that applies to a lot of you today. So that um, rent supplement uh, might not be of help or of use to many of your tenants. Um, I will note though that uh, provincial, um, those that do, uh, those tenants that already receive provincial income and disability assistance, um, they are receiving a bonus supplement of $300 um, to their, uh, I guess, assistant, assistance payments mm -hmm. um, over the next three months. So that's, that might be helpful to some of you. Um, for those of you that receive uh, funding from CMHC, there are some relief measures available. Um, CM CMHC is offering uh, loan or mortgage payment deferrals. Um, there's also some payment arrangements that can be arranged. Um, so for those of you that do operate under funding or agreements uh, through CMHC, it's recommended that you contact them directly. Um, for those uh, nonprofit housing, uh, providers that um, cater specifically to Indigenous uh, communities. The government's also created a relief fund. Um, I know I think it's for um, urban organizations. The deadline to apply is April 13th. It's coming up soon. So that might be um, a means of kind of assistance for a landlord during this time that provides housing only to First Nations. Um, to reiterate, unfortunately, <laughs> um, if a tenant doesn't pay rent, there's not much you can do. Um, as we discussed uh, a few slides ago, if um, a tenant doesn't pay rent, a landlord can't 
issue a notice to end tenancy um, during this time for non-payment of rent. Um, so there's not much you can do there. What we've done for some housing providers that rent at market rates is that our firms kind of prepared a rental um, deferral agreement. So this is just to protect the landlord's interests and rights, um, just so it's not uh, understood as a waiver. So um, this agreement essentially says, you know, the landlord understands that a tenant might not be able to pay or cannot pay rent uh, during this crisis um, throughout uh, while the COVID pandemic exists. Um, so both parties are agree agreeing to defer rent payments until um, the state of emergency is lifted, but the tenant is still liable for, for um, full rent payments and full rent payments will be made to the landlord. So our firms um, drafted this for, um, as I said, for those housing providers that rent at market rates. If um, you know you're a nonprofit that operates independently of government funding, um, perhaps something similar like this could be drafted for you. So you're free to contact um, our firm. You can email me after um, this uh, after this webinar or contact Grant, and maybe that's something you can look into. Another uh, topic. Um, so we're moving on. Um, the emergency order also uh, goes over rent increases and what's allowed and what's not allowed. So right now, um, landlords can still serve a notice of rent increase. That's no problem. Uh, serve away if you're looking to increase the annual rent. Um, however, uh, it won't be effective. So during this period, no rent increases can um, be effective. So as a landlord, you cannot collect a rent increase um, until this emergency order ceases to be effect in effect. So a question that usually pops up is what if I gave the tenant, um, you know, the required three month notice of a rent increase that's going to take place during this order. So let's say if a landlord hypothetically served a notice of rent increase in, um, let's say January, the end of January, and it was supposed to come into effect March 31st, doesn't that still kind of take effect? No. It doesn't. So even if you've served a notice of rent increase outside the period or before this emergency order came into effect, too bad, so sad, you can't uh, increase rent. <laughs> um, you can't collect on that. There is one exception. So um, one exception that the order recognizes is if um, the tenant is housing an, an additional occupant and the landlord agrees to the tenant being able to house that additional occupant, um, then both parties can amend the um, tenancy agreement between them and issue a rent increase and landlords can do, do it that way for the additional occupant um, but otherwise no and um, I would advise that landlords not collect any illegal rent increases at this time um, just because uh, the order states that a tenant can thereby reduce the rent um, by that additional rent increase that wasn't supposed to be collected during this emergency order or they can file a dispute with the rtb to get that money back mm -hmm. so don't enforce for the most part don't enforce or collect on any rent increases that's not allowed during this time so this is kind of an interesting topic um uh so i'm excited that we're at this slide now um we've had a lot of questions our firm has uh in this regard um, so what the order states is um, a landlord can now restrict the use of common or shared areas uh, to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, so this applies to both tenants and guests of the rental building. So what we've seen um, and what's completely legal and permitted is that, uh, you know, landlords are closing or shutting down common areas, gardens, gyms, pools, um, those type of facilities or common rooms that were normally open and available um, under normal circumstances, you can shut them down and close them off, um, not just to guests, but to tenants. So they can be closed indefinitely during this crisis. The order kind of gives a landlord a power to do that. Um, the order does differentiate when it comes to a tenant's individual unit, though. So um, what the order says is that a landlord cannot, excuse me, cannot prevent or interfere um, with a tenant's access to their individual unit or suite. Um, so they can't do this in regards to the tenant, in regards to any other occupants that live there, or in regards to guests. Um, of course, this creates some ambiguity in the law because normally guests have to access or pass through common areas to get to a rental unit. Um, so under the act, uh, common areas include, um, you know, lobbies, 
elevators, hallways. So the order says you can restrict guests there, but not in a rental unit. Doesn't really add up. So we've had some um, clients uh, and we've heard through the grapevine that some housing providers are just enacting a strict no guest, no visitor policy. If you read the order a certain way, it looks like that's legal and that's allowed. This hasn't been tested at the RTB yet. Um, and I wouldn't encourage tipping off tenants, but if a tenant says, um, you know, a landlord's interfering with that strict no visitors, no guest policy, um, that they're interfering with my right to have guests in my unit, um, and that's against the act, that might be upheld by an arbitrator, or the arbitrator might just uphold the uh, landlord's no guest policy altogether. This hasn't been tested yet. Uh, you can try it. Like I said, there's other housing providers that are saying, you know, no guests, no visitors allowed. Um, but if a tenant tests this at the RTV, uh, it remains to be seen um, as to how the RTV will rule on this. Um, so now let's move on to the next tenant, um, or subject, I should say, rather than tenant, um, that's covered by this residential tenancy order. <clears throat> I want to save time for questions, but I have to remember to clear my throat and give it some water. <clears throat> so another um, aspect that the emergency order covers is um, the landlord's right to enter a unit. So under normal circumstances, a landlord can just serve a tenant um, with a notice of inspection or a notice to enter the unit as long as it states the reason and as long as the notice is received or given to the tenant a full 24 hours before entry. Um, that's no problem. That's legally allowed. Uh, now that's severely restricted. So a landlord can't enter a rental unit without agreement or permission from the tenant to do so. Of course, the only exception is if um, you know, a landlord's entry is needed to save life or property. So if it's an emergency, of course, you can enter the rental unit without the tenant's agreement. Um, however, otherwise, landlord notices to enter aren't enough. You need the tenant's approval and agreement. So what I would recommend is if you're serving a notice to enter a unit, um, ensure that you have some response from the tenant or an agreement that entry is allowed. And then that way there won't be any ambiguity as to whether or not you've followed the rules in this case. Um, I understand that uh, I think this exception is just to capture any non-urgent repairs. Um, you know, if there are empty suites, if the landlord wants to arrange for open houses um, or if any suite inspections need to be done. Um, so this is one way to do it um, as well. I mean, but given the times, um, you know, it's important to be conscious of uh, health and safety and the risks posed to others. So it might just be good practice to defer any inspections um, if they're not urgent or highly necessary at this time. And the law doesn't say that, but that's just a practical standpoint. But in the event that you do have to enter to make some non-urgent repairs or something, serve the tenant with notice, but also have the tenant reply in some shape or form in writing um, that they agree to allow you access to do so. So now I'm kind of just going to discuss some of the changes uh, that have been made to uh, the residential tenancy, I guess say not act because these aren't, this isn't a law that's been enacted, but it's a kind of a practice directive that's been issued by the director of the residential tenancy board. Um, and he's kind of um, issued some statements that affect the rules regarding to dispute proceedings, how to serve notices and so on and so forth. So we're gonna get into that now. Um, so currently, um, as long as this order remains in effect, personal service is illegal. So do not hand deliver or personally serve any notice, whether it's um, you know a notice, whether it's serving an order of possession, whether it's a notice to enter, no hand delivery that's not allowed. Um, registered mail is not recommended um, to serve tenants at this time. There's some issues, of course, with Canada Post. Um, you guys are encouraged to keep up to date um, and check websites. But um, Canada Post isn't directly delivering to people's homes at this time. So what a tenant is required to do is go to the nearest postal outlet and pick up his or her package. But um, this directive states that um, a tenant doesn't have to. So before in the past, if let's say a tenant was served but with um, an evidence package for a dispute hearing by registered mail, if they chose not to pick it up, it was too bad, so sad, they were deemed served. 
that's not the case now. So if a tenant exercise, exercises their right to not pick up that package at the postal outlet, they're allowed to do so. And then the landlord won't be considered to have served the tenant. So that's why we're not recommending that clients um, pursue or use registered mail for service. Um, don't do personal service either. Um, what's a, a wonderful update, especially the millennial me, like this really resonated. <laughs> Looks like the RTB has come up to speed with the times. Um, they're now permitting email service, which is great. Um, it's quick, it's effective, it's safe, um, minimal contact, no contact with others. Um, so now as per the directive, landlords can serve tenants um, through email. Um, so this includes uh, notices of dispute resolution hearing, notices to enter, um, even orders of possession can be served by email, which is wonderful. Um, you are, um, landlords are notified to be mindful of service deadlines. So if you send an email or send a notice to a tenant by email, it's deemed serves three days um, after that email is sent. So if you're working with an evidence deadline, um, Add three days plus one day. So make sure to send it four days before um, your evidence deadline for an RTV dispute matter. Or if you're looking to enter a unit um, and you want the tenant's permission, a minimum of four days, I would say, before you require entry into that rental unit. Um, I guess a practice tip I would suggest at this time, because um, you know, it's email service is finally allowed only during the time that this effect is in order. Um, that landlords can kind of send out an email blast to all the tenants that they have in their residential property and they can just make sure that um, the email that uh, the landlords have on um, file is up to date. Um, this way in the event that you do have to serve um, a tenant with something that they you know that they might not be happy to get such an such as an order of possession or something else you've already confirmed that that's the email that you are to serve them with um so it's kind of preemptive um we don't want to wait till things get antagonistic and um have to we have to prove uh that the tenant was served by email um i know that the order states deemed service but um i've run across a situation where a tenant has left a written note um, for a landlord after a tenancy has ended stating that he is locked out of his email and that email address doesn't work. Um, he didn't provide a forwarding address and he didn't provide a new email. So we're kind of hooped now as to how to serve him. Um, so just to avoid that situation, um, you know, send it a weekly, or send it an email blast this week asking tenants to confirm their, uh, their email address is the one that's um, on file and that that's still active and that, that tenants still use it. So that's just a good practice tip there. Um, for those uh, serving tenants who don't have email addresses, you can still serve by posting to a unit store or you can place it, um, place any notices in their uh, individual mail slot or mail receptacle. So that's a way to do it. And again, that for that, the old rules still apply. Um, it's deemed reserved, deemed received three days after the fact. All right, so I'll just go over some other points as well um, before uh, we kind of get to the question and um, answer session, which is the exciting part. Um, so the head office of the Residential Tenancy Board is now closed. Um, that's located in Burnaby on Kingsway. So any filing should be done electronically. Um, so that's just to keep in mind. Um, so normally if you are asking for a review of a decision, or if you want to amend um, a dispute for a monetary order uh, that had to be done in person, that can all now be done online. Um, the residential tenancy uh, website has more information. So normally you would just email, um, well, I guess not normally. Normally you would go in person. Now you can just email um, these, uh, the, uh, these requests directly to the RTB given um, given the circumstances uh, in light of COVID-19. Um, business otherwise, for the most part, is continuing as usual. Um, landlords and tenants are still able to file uh, for dispute resolution through the RTB. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, th there's an online portal and that's how you file for a dispute resolution. So that's still up and running and there's been no changes to that. Um, if you do have a RTV dispute resolution that's scheduled, they're also continuing as usual. So I'm sure most of you are also aware that normally hearings are conducted over the phone. It's um, a teleconference situation. Um, so that's still 
going ahead. So if you have a hearing scheduled next week, don't assume it's canceled because of COVID-19. It's still proceeding. Um, if, if in any event, um, either party has to adjourn um, the hearing, parties can do so through the normal avenue, which is uh, uh, you can just sign a consent to adjourn, um, make sure to have both the landlord and tenant signature on it. Um, this can be done electronically. So just, you know, e-sign, send it to the tenant to e-sign, and then you would just give that to the RTB by email. A minimum of three days before the hearing is supposed to take place. Um, if you don't decide to adjourn three days before the hearing, if someone falls sick and or, or an emergency happens, parties also have the option of dialing in and uh, during the preliminary part of the hearing, just stating that um, you know one of the parties has fallen ill, um, whether it's COVID related or otherwise, and the hearing needs to be adjourned. So this can be done by consent. Um, another important point of discussion uh, is surrounding the limitations order that's been issued by the Supreme Court. So I know some of you might be aware that the Supreme Court's um, issued a pause, essentially, on timelines to file actions. So normally you have a window to file an action um, or make a claim. It's, norm it's called a limitation period. So for actions um, filed in the Supreme Court related to civil matters, criminal matters, um, family law, there's a limitation pause in effect. But this didn't really give specific instructions to the residential tenancy branch or other tribunals like the Human Rights Tribunal. What uh, this order regarding limitations essentially said was that the tribunals have discretion to make their own call on as to whether or not they want to allow for extensions to bring forward disputes or, you know, be loose with timelines regarding filing of evidence and other timelines. Um, so the RTB, um, their directive, it kind of goes over this. And this is, um, you'll find it on that link that I provided at the beginning of the slide. So what the RTB has kind of decided in terms of whether to allow for extensions or timeline pauses um, in light of COVID-19 is as follows. Um, so there's no give on the two-year limitation for a landlord or a tenant to file with a dispute resolution um, or with the tribunal for dispute resolution after the end of a tenancy. So if you are dealing with um, a tenancy that ended in, in or around the spring of 2018, you should file for dispute resolution if there's still something outstanding ASAP. Um, you likely won't be granted an extension um, because of the limitation period. Um, interestingly for landlords, uh, a tenant's timeline to dispute a notice to end tenancy is also not extended. So if you served the tenant, let's say, with a one month notice to end tenancy back on March 1st, um, they would only have 10 days to dispute it. If they didn't dispute it within those 10 days, you can um, file with the RTV for an order of possession. Whether you'll get it or not, that depends, but um, tenants don't have longer than usual to dispute any notices that they've been served with. Also, service of a dispute resolution notice, um, that's the regular timeline applies. So if you do file with the RTB for a dispute resolution, um, serve that notice as soon as you can, as soon as you get it, within three days of receiving it from the RTB directly to the tenant. And email was probably the best way at this time. They have, the RTB has kind of um, given, you know, permitted extensions or exceptions in one, in one kind of area. So normally if, um, if a tenant is unable or any party, if a tenant or landlord can't comply with a timeline um, or attend a hearing, um, they can be granted an exception um, under extraordinary circumstances. So this is normally along the lines of, you know, if someone's hospitalized for a long period of time and they can dispute a notice to end tenancy in time, or if, you know, someone gets, God forbid, gets in a car accident at the time of the hearing and they weren't able to attend, things like that are exceptional circumstances where um, you can gr be granted leave or an extension. So what the RTB has done is they've included COVID-19 as an exceptional circumstance. So if a party isn't able to file something in time, um, such as evidence um, or submissions that they want, um, you know, before an arbitrator at a dispute hearing, 
if a party isn't able to, um, you know, dispute a notice to end tenancy or um, attend a hearing because of COVID-19, they're allowed to use that um, to be granted an exemption. Um, and the bar is pretty low for proving that COVID-19 was a reason that you couldn't comply or attend a hearing. So as landlords, be on the lookout for that. Um, if you know you have a no-show by a tenant um, at a dispute hearing during this time, um, tenants can review a decision and have a second hearing um, and plead COVID-19 if that's the case um, and there's a low barrier to do so. So they don't have to provide any medical evidence, they just have to list the fact that COVID-19 happened or affected their ability to either file evidence or attend a dispute hearing. So that's something that I anticipate might come up for some of you. As noted, if you are applying for any amendment, um, a review request um, of a decision, a correction of an arbitrator's decision, that can all now be done online. Uh, so if you have some questions that weren't covered by this hearing or by this uh, webinar, I should say, um, I've included a link to the Residential Tenancy Board's phone and general email. Um, that's still up and running. Um, they're able to provide great information um, on the changes. Uh, of course, they can't render any legal advice, but um, if you have a quick question about the order and a specific uh, part of the tenancy, um, then it's a, a wonderful resource to call. Um, another kind of great resource for quick questions about the changes the emergency order has enacted and what that means for um, landlords um, and for residential tenancies um, is the facts page. So that was mentioned at the beginning of this uh, seminar as well, and I've re-included the link there. And if you have a question that's more complicated uh, and nuanced, um, don't try to guess it out or troubleshoot yourself. I mean, this is an uncertain time. Um, as we've discussed throughout this webinar, the orders conflicts with a lot of the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, there's some gaps in the order. There's some situations that the order doesn't kind of anticipate. So if your question is a bit more comp uh, complex and nuanced, um, ask a housing lawyer. Um, it's better to be safe um, and navigate this in certain time with um, some professional advice. All right, so now we're on to the fun part. Um, I'm going to start by answering some of the questions that were submitted to us, um, or I should say to the uh, webinar organizer ahead of, ahead of time. Um, and then I'll turn it to Kate after I'm done um, asking those or answering those advanced questions, and then we can get into, um, into those that were provided um, during my spiel. Um, it's about, we're about 50 minutes in, but I do have some extra time so we can stay a little bit later just so we make sure um, that we can tackle as many questions as possible. So the first question we, that um, we received in advance was the following. I'm just going to read it out first. Um, could we have some guidance, please, on how to deal with an occupant who is verbally abusive, um, issues racist comments against staff, and who is also spitting when in shared areas of the facility. The tenant also um, performs disturbing. I'm so sorry about that. We, um, I just uh, had a bit of an emergency to deal with. Um, so back to the question. Um, so this tenant's uh, exhibiting disruptive behaviors. Um, and so what can a landlord do? So based on the question, it seems like this is an exceptional circumstance. Um, so what we would suggest is that the landlord does have the option of just applying with the Residential Tenancy Board and filing a dispute through the online portal. Um, I'm not sure if the tenant uh, at issue is suffering mental health or addiction issues. Um, if that's the case, then it's suggested that the landlord um, contact um, a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, um, we do practice in some human rights law as well, um, to consider any issues uh, related to accommodation that might pop up. Um, otherwise, the best route would be to apply with the Residential Tenancy Board for an emergency order of possession. Um, I always suggest to keep detailed evidence in this regard. Um, that's very important, especially if you're trying to argue that this is an exceptional circumstance that necessitates ending a tenancy early. Uh, so what to do is, um, you know, keep witness statements. Um, if you have witnesses that are willing to uh, provide testimony at the hearing, that's great. If um, 
If you, uh, you know, have security camera footage, that's even better. So all the evidence that you can gather, uh, the better. Um, and that would be the route to do it. Um, if you are given an order of possession under this emergency exceptional circumstance, as discussed, it should be pretty easy to uh, enforce it because that it's an exception. So the Supreme Court will file it as well. So now moving on to the second question. Um, can you please comment on the requirement to report COVID-19 cases of tenants to public, to public health agencies? Um, how does this affect uh, privacy laws and privacy requirements regarding tenancies? What are housing providers required to do to find out if a tenant has a confirmed case? Who, how, and what information is the housing provider supposed to report? Um, so currently there's no legal requirement uh, requiring landlords to report suspected or um, confirmed COVID cases. Um, I will emphasize that uh, landlords cannot end a tenancy for any suspected cases of COVID-19 or confirmed cases. This is a clear violation of the Human Rights Act. So um, don't issue a notice to end tenancy if you have a tenant um, that's sick or don't apply for dispute resolution, I, I should say, to end the tenancy if that's the case. Um, that's not allowed. If you do have a um, tenant that you suspect um, or that does have a confirmed case of COVID-19, well, I should say suspect because it's hard for a lay person to diagnose such a case. But if landlords um, suspect that tenants do have um, COVID, uh, they can contact both BC Housing and um, reach out and communicate with their regional health um, authority. So Vancouver Coastal Health, Fraser Health, um, all the regional health authorities have phone lines that landlords can call or text. Um, it's set up for this specific purpose um, to report suspected cases and uh, both BC Housing and um, the uh, Ministry of Health will provide detailed information on how to proceed. Um, there, again, I'll emphasize there's no legal obligation to report suspected cases, but this is one thing that landlords can do to ensure that you're, you know, complying with the act and complying with the requirements to um, provide uh, a secure and safe premises for other tenants. Um, other ways that landlords can ensure um, safe and secure premises for everybody during this time is to distribute information such as pamphlets, um, uh, um, regarding safe practices. So it's mentioned that's offered by the Ministry of Health on their websites. Um, landlords can now legally also uh, prohibit or restrict access to common rooms. Um, there's also um, other useful information regarding cleaning protocols that landlords can use. Um, and that's all listed on the uh, Ministry of Health website. Um, I will note that BC Housing is also working to provide critical supplies for frontline employees. Um, and uh, there's a statement there. I think they're um, gathering cleaning products as well. So they have some, some I guess, uh, resource for um, housing providers that might need additional supplies and materials. Um, with regards to the privacy question, there's no change um, with uh, with regards to privacy law and residential tenancies. If such a change does happen, that's going to be posted most likely on um, the Residential Tenancy Board COVID-19 update page, which I've listed at the beginning. So no change in terms of privacy there. Um, just backtracking to the previous question, I will note if um, housing providers are dealing with um, uh, you know, tenants who are vulnerable um, or require special assistance. Um, BC Housing has formed a provincial vulnerable population working group. Um, they're going to issue a report. They haven't yet, but it's coming. So follow up with the BC Housing website to see um, when that working group has released their report. Um, they've been formed to identify stressors for marginalized and vulnerable tenants um, and their housing providers. Um, so that should be up and running soon. So let's move on to another question we received. Um, what to do if a tenant passes away? Uh, the Tenancy Act limits our access. Um, we can't have family visit to retrieve personal contents. Um, what if a last will and testament is not available or in the unit of the deceased person? So this topic um, is a little outside of the purview of the seminar, 
Um, it's best to contact a wills and estate lawyer for more information. Uh, normally, generally, if a person dies without a will under law, um, normally an administrator is appointed to manage the estate. Um, in terms of the specifics that were provided uh, re regards to this question, um, if you are housing seniors or, you know, um, residents that require specific medical assistance, that kind of alerts me right away that your rental property might not even fall under the purview of the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, so the act states, if a residential property provides therapeutic treatment, medical services, meals, and other essential services, um, it's exempt from the application of the Residential Tenancy Act altogether. Um, so perhaps uh, uh, much of the seminar was not uh, applicable, but um, I would confirm and with a lawyer and double check if that's the case or not. Um, but if you have been involved in the dispute process before and the RTA does apply to you, um, if a tenant passes away, then this is recognized as an emergency or exceptional circumstance and a landlord can apply through the dispute resolution um, portal, the online portal for um, an order of possession of the unit. Um, so this is a case uh, if a tenant passes away where the tenancy is frustrated, which means it can no longer continue. So um, that's one way to end the tenancy and ensure that you get possession of the unit again and that you can re-rent it to somebody else. Um, a note that if the tenant has passed away, all communication, all notices should be served on the tenant's administrator or um, of the estate. Um, that would be who you would serve with this, um, with any materials to end the tenancy. So another question we received was to what extent is the landlord responsible for managing common spaces such as elevators, common gardens, common meeting rooms? So this was discussed earlier in the seminar. Um, again, the landlord may uh, restrict access to common areas, um, which includes uh, lobbies, elevators, so on and so forth. So by restricting access, you can post notices um, stating that social distancing must be followed, um, stating that you know tenants are not too entertain certain you know numbers of guests um that's one option um of course many landlords have altogether just closed or shut down common meeting rooms garden spaces uh gyms pools that's all allowed under the order um so that's legal to do as well um as discussed as well some landlords have a strict no guest no visitor policy so whether this will be upheld or not um you know not allowing a tenant to uh have guests in their individual unit or suite. Whether that's the case, it's unsure if an arbitrator will uphold that. It hasn't been tested yet. A lot of uh, um, landlords have enacted a strict no visitor ban. So um, that's, that's one option, I guess. Another question we received was, should we be doing rent reviews with changes to income? Um, yes. Uh, so for income that's subsidized uh, based on a specific income amount that the tenant receives, um, either tenants or landlords on behalf of tenants can review and recalculate rent based on a change of income um, that the tenant's facing due to COVID-19. So BC Housing has a step-by-step -step process for this on their website. So um, if a tenant's income changes and rent subsidized based on that, um, contact BC Housing and they will walk you through the process. Another question we received was um, uh, an issue regarding the rent moratorium. Um, so normally, as we discussed during this uh, presentation, is that um, rent increases are ineffective during this period, as long as the emergency order remains in place. Um, the question specifically was, um, BC Housing stated that the rent moratorium does not apply to subsidized tenants um, where rent is based on income. Um, I wasn't sure if the increases uh, were frozen until the pandemic or not. So regularly they are. Um, this is a question where I'm not 100% sure about. So the best answer would be to contact BC Housing directly. What I can say is I know that um, rental units that receive funding from BC Housing um, to subsidize rent that's paid by a tenant Normally they're outside of the umbrella of the RTA. They're exempt from that act when it comes to rent increases. 
Perhaps what BC Housing's intention was this with this was that the tenant rent calculation that happens um, annually would still be proceeding. But for that one, the best um, answer would be uh, to contact BC Housing directly. So those were just um, the questions we re received in advance. Now I'm going to turn it back to Kate and um, hopefully answer some of the questions that uh, <laughs> that we've gotten during this presentation. Great, thanks for that, Rip, and that a uh, lot of really great information. No problem. And I just want to give you a chance to uh, rest your your voice for a minute. <laughs> Okay, so um, we had a couple of questions come in, and uh, please forgive me, they're quite lengthy. I'm going to try my best to condense them, but a few of them, and I know you've touched on this, but it's probably worth uh, mentioning it again. Um, several societies are posting signage, you know, saying that they have no visitors allowed, um, and then there's uh, people, there's uh, tenants um, having guests come in and they're worried about these tenants um, compromising other people because um, the residents of the societies are immune compromised. So can they evict uh, tenants for allowing these guests to keep coming in, to continuously coming in their units? Yeah, so this is kind of a gray area. I mean, um, especially if you're housing immunocompromised um, residents. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is not cooperating with me this morning, but um, it might be the the only kind of way around this right now would be just to kind of roll the dice. So you can bring forward um, an action with the RTV dispute and state this is an emergency that the tenant is um, threatening the health and safety of other residents by allowing guests and um, ask for an order of possession. Um, I can't guarantee that an arbitrator will uphold that, but also there's a chance um, that the arbitrator might not. Um, so the best resolution would be just to try to file a dispute online um, and get an order of possession that way. Okay, great. Um, there's a nonprofit housing society that uh, has a partnership with BC Housing that provides subsidy for some units. Um, they have two suites with tenants on subsidy, and the tenants have guests staying with them. Um, since landlords can't evict at this time, what options do they have as landlords to have the guests leave the units? Um, with the guests staying, one unit would then be underhoused and the other is overhoused. All right, so there's additional occupants, it seems like, that aren't supposed to stay there. Um, it's like that, yeah. Maybe? Sorry, yes, it sounds like that. They're yeah. saying guess, yes, quote, quote, unquote. <laughs> yeah, so if I'm, it's kind of a tough time because um, landlords' hands are kind of tied with regards to uh, this. Um, so as we discussed at the outset, unfortunately, breach of a material term such as housing and additional occupant might not be considered an exception or an emergency that necessitates ending a tenancy. Um, what you could do if you try filing, um, there's no way to kind of, um, I'm not sure how this, this would go. So if you file for an order of possession, that would essentially end the tenancy or not. Um, you could try to file um, a dispute resolution for the tenant to comply with the terms, which would require removing the additional guest. So that's not asking for an order of possession, but that's asking for compliance. Um, so that would probably be the best way to do it um and and ask for that uh, additional occupant to be removed so those are the two things um essentially there's no hard and clear answer um a lot of this discretion is unfortunately in the hands of individual arbitrators so i know it's not a direct um kind of path to the outcome that you wanted but that would be the kind of best options to um kind of deal with this at this time Great. Um, one of our members has just saying, this is a comment, that they filed for an expedited hearing for a tenant allowing homeless people through the building and not following social distancing, and they've been given a date for an April 30th hearing. So that's just a, a comment that somebody has uh, provided. Yeah, well, that's exciting. Um, uh, I wish I was in on that hearing because that's... Uh... I would love to know the outcome of, um, you know, what the, that result would be. Um, it would give us some more clarity into 
how arbitrators are deciding to you know enforce the order in light of also that context of the need for social distancing all right someone's saying that they have an old order of possession but not a writ and the tenant was refused to review march 24th we would still have to go back to the arbitrator to cite the emergency legislation is that correct even if our original rtb decision mentions damage and unreasonable disturbance um so i'm not sure how old um this order of possession is if you've been issued that and uh you can essentially go two ways about it so one way is if you are filing this order of possession it sounds to me like it's an emergency or an exceptional circumstance so what you can do is in your affidavit or in the cover sheet um, that you attach to file these materials with the supreme court mention the reason for why um, this order of possession was issued if somewhere in the body of decision uh, of, of the decision um you know the damage and the um tenant's behavior is cited that might be enough um, so you can go and try to file it that way. Um, what we're kind of suggesting for tenants moving forward is get a quick review saying that it's issued under Section 56. I'm not sure the background of this old order of possession. I'm not sure if the damage uh, or if, if it was um, kind of um, issued under a Section 56, that might be enough. So in terms of time, what you can do is just try to file it. Um, on the cover sheet and in your affidavit, emphasize that it was issued um, due to this behavior of the tenant and um, as um, under a Section 56 application, and that might be enough. <clears throat> okay, great. Is there a clause in the temporary measures that the landlord can evict for arrears when state of emergency is lifted? No, there isn't. So this is, um, uh there's in the directive it says that landlords can um can uh of course bring an action for arrears once the state of emergency is lifted but it's silent it's silent on whether you know let's say that i'm being optimistic here but it's silent on as to whether if this order is lifted on june 30th can you then serve a tenant with a notice to end tenancy for unpaid rent on july 1st doesn't say um, so that's something that um, hopefully there's a directive issued in the future that will provide some clarity. Um, if not, then I anticipate there'll be a lot of litigation before the RTB um, regarding this if landlords are serving the notices to end tenancy. So that's just kind of one empty area that the order hasn't considered. Okay. Another question, would it be considered under special circumstances if a tenant is smoking in a non-smoking unit? So is that a special circumstance? Um, smoking, I mean, putting my like kind of a, well, thinking like a lawyer, anything could be argued to be a special circumstance. So are you housing those that are vulnerable to illness? Are you getting complaints from surrounding tenants that um, you know, they are vulnerable to smoke or um, that they're unable to sleep because of the smell of secondhand smoke um, or that they have, you know, bronchitis or severe asthma and therefore they can't have a smoker breaking the rules. If that's the case, then perhaps it would be an emergency order. Um, it's, it's tough to prove um, unless you have hard and consistent proof that this individual was smoking consistently. Um, arbitrators usually don't even for material breaches in the best of cases um, we have you know witness statements um, that are consistent and numerous over a period of time or security camera footage a lot of the time tenants can just say you can't prove that it was coming from my suite you can't prove it was me and then that's enough for them to discharge that burden of proof and you know strike out the landlord's claim so unless you have um you know extraneous evidence showing that um you know, the smoking is causing a severe problem or severe risk to other tenants, it's unlikely to hold. Of course, you can try it. Um, but um, so ultimately, it depends on its face value. It doesn't seem like smoking would be an exceptional circumstance. It seems more like a material breach of the tenancy instead. 
All right, you had mentioned about um, landlords closing off common areas such as gardens. Uh, somebody's asking, can they close off laundry rooms? Um, so laundry rooms, it, it depends. I'm not sure if a laundry is um, specifically included in a tenancy agreement um, as an amenity. Um, if it is, um, it's not an essential am amenity. Uh, so what, if you know if an individual tenancy is for that property laundry um, is included as a term what i would suggest is that the landlord if they are closing a laundry room offer a subsidy to tenants that are affected by closure of the laundry room however if um, laundry facilities aren't specifically ticked off in the tenancy agreement then um, you're within your liberty to just close it due to COVID 19. okay um, this question relates to fire inspections. So they're saying that the fire department in some municipalities are insisting that fire inspections in suites are completed um, due to regulatory requirements. Uh, some municipalities are showing a little more flexibility, but uh, for the munis municipalities that are not being flexible, as this is a life safety issue, can we insist that we enter the contractors um, do gen generally do not want to enter this either. However, this is putting the landlords in a very difficult position. Right. So um, considering fire uh, inspections are essential, the initial way to go forward is, um, you know, serving tenants with a landlord's notice to enter um, and then asking tenants to give a landlord permission to doing so. Um, if a tenant refuses access to a rental unit, even after the landlord has stated the reason, um, I don't think this would be an exceptional circumstance that allows a landlord to enter without the tenant's permission. Um, those would be more such as if there's you know, family violence occurring, if there's a fire within the unit, the best route to go about that would be to apply for a dispute resolution. If you have a tenant that's being particularly difficult and not allowing a fire inspection, give them notice once if they don't agree um, file with the rtb for um, dispute resolution and then you'll have an arbitrator which will order you um, uh, access to that rental unit to complete the inspection as scheduled so that's kind of the best way to go forward with um, tenants who are not allowing access for these essential um, checks and inspections okay great um, here's an interesting question. What provisions are in place for COVID-19 in tenants who live with the landlord? We frequently have international students staying at shared accommodation housing. So I'm not sure um, if the shared accommodation housing is um, renting a room within a house. So normally if um, tenants share, you know, common areas such as kitchens, bathrooms with the landlord um, that's not a tenancy that's covered under the residential tenancy act so um i'm not sure depending on the situation if that's uh if that's if that's even covered by this emergency order here um in regards to specific requirements uh regarding safety and social distancing other than the kind of suggestions that are pushed out by the ministry of health and uh, the province there's no strict requirements um it, which is i know unfortunate um but so that's where we run into problems like if someone's not following protocol and social distancing if they're not quarantining um i think the only law that's been passed or the only order that's been passed is if you know someone comes from travel then they're required by law um, to remain inside and quarantined for 14 days but other than that there's no hard and fast rule for what happens if someone doesn't follow social dis distancing protocols or um, self-isolation uh, if they're required to do so Okay, um, I'm just conscious of the time here, Ripin. We're at 11.15. Um, how are you for taking questions? Um, I could do two more and then I'm going to have to uh, cut it off there. All right. I'm just going to... Okay, you said that notices can be posted to doors or mailboxes. Could you clarify 
if this is an option for a notice of hearing packages and evidence packages, normally it is not an approved method of service. Um, so notices, uh, that is, so if you have evidence or submissions um, for, an hear for a hearing, you can place it in a mailbox or post to the door. So that's normally allowed um, and it's deemed served three days after the fact. Um, what I always recommend is keep a proof of notice um, that uh, the tenant's been served that way. So take photos, have a witness with you when you're posting to the door or um, placing it in a tenant's mailbox. Um, and that's allowed for um, notices of dispute now and it's also permitted for um, residential tenancy board hearings and evidence related to that. So that's, you can definitely do that. Okay, great. And the last question, once the order is lifted, will providers be able to evict on rent not paid during the order was in place? This is assuming tenants will not agree to a payment plan. Um, I think this kind of is similar to a question that I answered earlier. Um, so it's the order doesn't say anything with regards to that. Um, based on a strict reading, um, of course, you know, let's say the order's lifted if rent is outstanding. I don't see why a landlord couldn't serve a five day notice and tenancy for payment of rent. Um, so I'd say go for it, um, especially if you have a tenant that's been withholding rent for a long time. Um, there's nothing stating that you can't do that once the order is lifted. Um, so that would be the best route to go. Um, but again, you know, I apologize, I empathize if you're suffering on um, not receiving rent payments in the, in the meantime, it de definitely doesn't make it easy. All right, well, and there's a lot of great questions and I'm sorry that we couldn't get to them all. Um, perhaps uh, people could email, uh, contact Ripin or Haddock if they have uh, any further questions or maybe they have a more complex question that it would be worth um, consulting some a lawyer for some legal advice. Uh, Riffin, would you mind just uh, forwarding to the last slide? Sure. All right. Well, at this time, I would like to thank Haddock and Company and Riffin for an excellent presentation, and thank you to attendees for your great great questions. As mentioned, we'll be sending the link to this recording and the visual recording piece to all the participants within the next few days. And the recording will also be hosted on the BCMPHA website at bcmpha.ca forward slash forum. For more COVID-19 resources and upcoming education webinars, please visit the BCMPHA homepage at bcmpha.ca. Thanks again and have a great and safe long weekend. Take care everyone.